I'm CK. Tonight I think we've got an interesting one. It's another kit from WADA that I got from Jameco Electronics. It's an audio analyzer. That looks very interesting. I don't know how good it is, but at the price and for the fun of putting it together, it's probably going to be very much fun. So let's get it together and see how it actually works. Hope you enjoy the video. The box, typical WADA box, it's got a uh, outer sleeve which describes the product that can be taken off. I'm not going to take them both off. Uh, so they can use the same brown box and just put a new sleeve. So audio and hi-fi, audio analyzer, music, soldering, level 3, which is not that difficult in their scale. Valman VPA20. The box cover shows a range of plus 5 dB to negative 35 dB and the frequency and then looks like a mode button. Uh, small and compact, ideal for panel mounting, measures peak power, RMS, mean dB, peak dB, linear audio spectrum, and one-third octave audio selection. Well, that's pretty neat. Audio or manual range selection, 12 volt DC, soldering kit. Uh, it's got to have, it's got to have a Raspberry Pi or some high power. No, it looks like it's got a uh, processor, probably an Atmel processor. This product is meant for educational or experimental purposes only. Don't run your radio station on this. So let's see what's in the box. I mean, I can't imagine they have enough power to do fast Fourier transforms in a inexpensive package like this, but I could be wrong. This could be a really fantastic kit. We'll see. We'll see how the circuit looks. Okay, nothing else in the box, and that's good recyclable box. We'll get it ready for recycling. Now, let's look at the front panel. It's small. Just has a mode button. A little discoloration there. I don't know what that is. Look at the circuit board. This looks like the display mounting board. Yeah, that's where the LCD will go and the connector and another connector for that. And oh, it looks like we've got some surface mount capacitors here, which is dandy. Then on the main board, it's that kind of bronzy solder pads and they are not in fact through hole which is interesting so we've got connector a switch that's the mode switch I would assume one I see two I see that's probably an Atmel type uh, microprocessor looks like we got a uh, clock chip uh, not a clock chip a crystal here timing crystal here then we've got ground, plus 12 volts ground, and signal. A uh, bunch of resistors. None of them have values listed. We've got a couple of electrolytic caps. That's probably a voltage regulator right here. And I don't know. So if the signal comes in, huh? we'll see how it lays out. And we've got an online manual. Usually they include a uh, paper manual, but I guess they didn't want to. Maybe this is more extensive. I can scan the QR code on the packaging to get the build guide. Let's see what's in the big box, the big bag. pin header to join the master board to the LCD board. I'm going to dump the rest of this stuff out in this other bin. Pray. 
It, one little resistor doesn't want to come along. Come along, little resistor. These are little quarter watts, too. What? Uh, I hope those are just jumpers, because there's no component. There's just lead here. I don't know what that means. Fortunately, I've got a bunch of spare resistors in case they forgot some. Electrolytic. 10 uh, microfarad. Chip socket. And uh, that's probably, oh, that's a spacer. Here's the microprocessor, and it is not an Atmel. It's a Motorola chip, I think. Huh. And then an MCP60002. Oh, I know what that is. It's just not coming to mind right now. Then some bigger caps. 220 microfarad. Another connector type thingy. Some wire and a connector. Here's the big voltage regulator. That's pretty beefy. The other end of that wire I just looked at. Here's our surface mount caps. So not too much surface mount, but some. And here's the control switch. Some nice caps, some bigger caps, a couple of screws, a big old inductor, and an inductor, and where was that other thing I just had? Uh, no, I thought it was a no, I thought it was a ferrite core, and I was saying, why would you have a ferrite core and an inductor? But it wasn't; it was just another spacer. So that's the electronic components. Not a lot, because all the work is going on inside the processor. And in here, I'm going to make the assumption that this is the LCD, and it is. Nice LCD. Yeah, it's actually very nice. I like it. looks very good. I'm going to leave that in its foam for right now. So that's the bits and pieces. Again, doesn't look like a terribly difficult or long build. The only challenge, if you're not familiar, if you haven't done it, is soldering the surface mount capacitors, but we'll take that slow when we get to it. Now I'll get the soldering iron heated up and get the build guide up on my iPad and we'll put this thing together. I was wrong twice about the chip here. This is not a Motorola M. This is a microchip M. And secondly, this is a PIC 33FJ32GP and this actually is uh, they're designed to execute digital filter algorithms and high-speed precision digital control loops. So it probably does have FFTs in there. So I am corrected and glad because that means it's pretty dang powerful. This is not an, one of the more inexpensive kits. I think this was 50 or $60 uh, dollars US. One thing I do not see, and I just realized it as I was talking about the microcontroller is I do not see the timing crystal uh, and we didn't see it during our little unbagging of stuff because if I don't have the timing crystal I don't know what I'm gonna do let me oh uh, and they have a great build guide the other thing these are jumper wires so that's fine And I'm looking through here quickly to see if where there is a crystal. So 
we're going to mount the switch on the other side of the board. And that makes sense. Again, I couldn't see how it uh, fit the other way. It looks like, as I'm looking through these pictures, it looks like they don't... If, if I zoom this in out for you a little bit, here on the board is where the timing crystal slot is, and here's two capacitors and some other things, and it looks like the timing crystal is not actually mounted. So, that's just very interesting. And then they show you how to use it, and how to set it, and all kinds of other fun stuff. LEDs and how to use them. We don't have any LEDs in this product, guy. So that's it. Looks like it'll be fun, and again, because it's got this uh, high power, low energy uh, digital filtering DSP chip, that's going to be pretty good. That'll make it very useful. Maybe mount it in my studio on the uh, Euro rack. Okay, we got a bunch of jumper wires. We'll put those on first because they are obviously the lowest height components. See, again, these these caps don't exist, and that crystal doesn't ex exist, so maybe the jumper, uh, these two jumpers at J7, uh, J5 and J6, bypass them. It's hard to see. The lacquer on the back of this is really thick, so I can't see the traces underneath it, but I don't need to. We'll just go ahead and put the jumpers in. There's not a lot to say about jumpers, so I will just go through this in fast motion. All the jumpers are on. Now we'll do the resistors. And again, they're all quarter watt. Uh, look like they're all Gold tolerance. I'm gonna sort these and I'm gonna do that off camera because you don't want to watch me sort resistors. Hold on one second. All the resistors are sorted out and there are a lot of different values. So the next thing will be to put uh, all of these on. We're going to do them like we usually do on my channel. It is, we'll go into fast motion and all the resistors will fly onto the board and you can watch it and enjoy resistor time. That's resistor time, and I want to point out two things. First, R15 is all the way over here. I'm pointing it out so you don't spend five minutes like I did searching all around here trying to find out where the heck R15 is. It's over here. Uh, secondly, careful on the back of the board. Some of these pads are double these pads, these one, two, one, two, and this one, two, three, uh, they're continuous. So there's no break in the solder pad material. So uh, you could accidentally bridge over this hole. Just make sure you don't fill in the hole where you don't have a component lead. And if you do later on try and put a component through and say, why is it not going through? Hit yourself on the head and say, oh, I must have filled in one of those holes. So that is the resistors. Now we'll put the diode on. Where does it go? Where? There it is. It's got a heavy white stripe to show you where the stripe goes. That's nice. And I bent the leads too close to the body of the diode. 
So we got to work with it a little bit. There we go. I'm going to solder this before I put the IC socket on. I will put the IC socket on. Get it through the holes, make sure the notch is in the right place, lined up with the notch on the PCB. And this time I'm going to just hold it flat with two fingers. Do one, do one leg. Now take a look at it. It's a little up, so I'm going to, and that's only because of springiness in the leg. Not because it's misaligned, so I'm going to nail this one down too. There we go. Now, where I need a little piece of something to keep this up off the... That's not going to work, is it? I'll use this pin header. Keep that up a little bit while I solder all the legs on the IC socket. That's good. Now we will put the inductor on, or as they call it, the coil. And that'll go in L, whatever goes over there. Not a resistor, an inductor or a coil. We'll put the voltage regulator on. don't have a screw hole here to screw it down to uh, to screw it down firmly to so but I don't really care this is not going to be taking a whole bunch of strain and it's not going to be in a high vibration environment or any of those reasons why you might want to have it screwed down now the ceramic caps, we've got a number of them. Oh, and by the way, there is another note here that goes along with these jumpers telling you C12, C13, and X1 are not mounted. In other words, they are not part of this whole process we're going through. Okay, now we've got to build up our pin headers. So we're going to cut two nine pins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hope I got that right. But I'll put mark it with my cutters. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, Nine. That one will go there. Are all the pins filled? Yes. And we'll do the same thing again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Mark it with my cutters. Now count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. Oops. And the extra piece goes flying off into space. The rest of these are not needed for this build because they will mount the LED display here. Now the caps. So we've got Two 10 microfarads. Let's find those. There's a 4.7. That's a 4.7. That's a 220. Another 220. And the two 10s. So that's C4 and C5. Polarity markings on the board. The long lead is the positive side, of course. And 
Now the 220s at C6 and C7. At C6. And this it, it is slipping away from me. It is C7. guys all up. Oop, I forgot. I've got my now with the mount a connector. This goes in SK1, which is right here. Actually SK1 is here, but the description of what the pins are is here. And I'm looking at the picture to make sure I've got the, I will have the connector orientation right. And it goes like so with the back thingy, whatever you want to call it, on the outside. Now we're going to mount the switch on the solder side. not on the other side. So now again as we look at this the LED panel, LED LCD screen will go like so, the switch will be like that and it'll mount in the panel like that. Oops! Won't mount anything if the switch just wants to jump and run off. Don't skimp on the solder here because it's doing two things. It's making the electrical contact, but is also providing mechanical support when you're pressing this button. And now we'll put the ICs on. Let me put this on the board, making sure the notch goes in the right places, and making sure all the pins go in straight and firm, and they did. It's the notch, and the notch will go there. I need to pin the pins in just a hair more. in and none appear to be bent. It's a way to test that by the way. If you are, if you are ever in doubt about whether a uh, IC went into the bore into its socket well, just take your meter and put it in continuity mode and just rest it on the pin you're concerned about and tap the other end. And you can hear it's solder. It's in the socket correctly because it's got continuity. So never hesitate to check things like that if you're ever concerned about anything. Now we're going to do the surface mount components on the back of this board. Uh, it's a relatively simple surface mount job but still something uh, that you want to be careful about. And if it's your first time doing surface mount, don't fret about it. It just takes a little bit more care, but I'm going to show you how I do it. I'm not alone in doing it this way, just how I do it. So what I'll do is I'm going to put a little dollop of solder on that solder pad. Again, this is just an example for right now. Now I'm going to take all the, I would normally tin all the pads, but I'm not going to do that right yet. I'm just going to do one at a time so you can see what I'm doing. Now I'm going to do the hardest part, which is getting them out of that packaging. 
because the packaging is designed for machines to un to get access to these, not for human beings. Get my little exacto knife blade. Separate the little cellophane from the back. These are big, as such things go, these are big surface mount capacitors, and I'll dump them on the parts tray like so. Doesn't matter which all way these go on. Now I will get my fine point tweezers. I have a video on finding the right tweezers and getting a good set of tweezers on the channel if you want to look at that, see what you may want to invest in for your shop, but you need a good set of tweezers or multiple good sets of tweezers if you're going to do surface mount. So now I'm going to hold the capacitor. I'm going to reheat this solder pad, push the capacitor onto it, let the solder cool, and there she is. Easy as can be. And for the other side, I will just solder it like a normal type component. Oh, one thing, I'm sorry, I didn't say this. Uh, I switched solder to this. This is uh, MG Chem Chemicals out of Canada. It's their thinnest fluxed solder. It's 0 0.025 inch and it does have a, a flux core. Uh, I find this is my favorite for surface mount work. So I'll do the rest of these, and of course no commentary, you've seen one, and I'll speed up the playback. First thing I'm going to do, just to repeat, is tin all these pads. Now, we put the connector that we're going to hit those pins onto, and it goes on this side. Now that's interesting, it calls that SK1 also. Uh, I guess that's because it's the first one on this board, but when you're doing two boards, you can't have two SK1 and SK1s, that's a little bit of a problem. Typically a, a board designer will add like a zero in front of that. So this would be SK1 and this would be SK01 or SK101 or something like that to differentiate components on different circuit boards because this is not, this can be a little confusing. And that's all of those guys. Now we're going to find where I put the display. Where did I put this? There it is. And we are going to solder this down. Now this can be a little bit tricky. We don't want to get it hot. I also don't want to get junk on it, which I already have. But I'll wipe that. I'll clean that off before we finalize this. Where's my little... Where in the... There it is. My little cloth. So I'm going to solder these two lugs first. That's the support lugs for this LCD. Of course, it's the cloth I'm using is so slippery, I'm having to fight with it. Okay, that's on. Is it flat? It's flat. Is it flat all the way around? It is flat all the way around. Good. So I'll set this down on a little polishing cloth and do the other lug. Now I'll do each of these pins and as you can see they're very small and we got to be careful. Now the LCD screen is in place. Let me wipe my fingerprints off this.
enough. Now, roughen the four bolts with a knife file. Oh, okay. So we're going to solder these. Hmm, interesting. So before we solder them, they're recommending we rough them up a little bit with some sandpaper. And I had, I just saw sandpaper under here. Where did it go? So I'm taking a look at the picture. So we're going to take these four screws, put them in there like so. Now I'm going to turn this over momentarily. Hopefully I can do it without the screws falling out. And I did. Yay me. Now we're going to take the four spacers. Put them on the screws. And now we're going to take the... Trying to get this exactly... Huh, that's interesting. The capacitors are laid out differently on the... Uh, board that they have there than is here. So there's the row of connectors for the display panel. So we're going to drop this over here. Get the screws through at least a little bit. I feel like something's binding. Is anything binding? No. And of course I by doing what I just did, I dropped a screw out because I'm an idiot. So, I'll put a nut on here just, oops. Put a nut on here just a couple of turns to keep this screw from falling out. Often, and I'm going to go ahead and do it on the side. This is just easier for me. Uh, often the mechanical assembly of stuff like this is harder than the, or more painstaking than the electronics assembly. Oh, I see what it's trying to do. I see what's going on. The, the pin headers are trying to go together, which is fine. I'll just go ahead and mate them. Except, I dropped the spacer out, so we'll pull this screw back. Come on. Take this screw back. And of course, everything I did to wipe off the uh, LCD screen is completely invalid now because I'm putting my hand all over it. And we'll put that one through there. Put a couple of turns on here. Oh, I see what they're doing. Oh, that's kind of goofy. Now, you don't want to turn this nuts down too much. I, I don't know how much right yet, because we're going to do something a little bit goofy here. The way they're making this work is we're going to put the front panel on and we are going to position the LCD flat against the display and with the mode button pushing out. Wow, that, that's not got a lot of throw. And then we are going to actually solder the screws, the screw heads to these panel, these solder dots, solder pad dots on the front panel, which is kind of goofy. So as you can see, I've moved to the edge. Actually, I'm going to flip my solder pad over and use one of the holes so that the switch doesn't interfere with what I'm doing. Now, they recommend you tape this down uh, to do this, uh, but I don't, I'm not going to do that. 
you may want to. In fact, if in fact, you probably should. I just don't particularly want to. Now we're going to solder some screws down. Oops, and I moved. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to put a little pool of solder like we've done before and just get this all ready. heat transfer here to get these screws to be soldered on. In fact, this is a really, this is not a great way to do this. I would be perfectly happy to have screw heads coming through the front of the panel and get a good mechanical connection instead of this kind of monstrosity. Now, all the screws are in place, the nuts are not tight yet. Oh, this screw is not. This screw came out of its little solder nest. Let me give you a look here. If I can zoom in on this. And for some reason, I've got freaking color bars in the way. I'm going to go over here so I can see it. You can see I've built up quite a pool of solder right here to hold that screw in place. And again, I, I've, I'm still not comfortable with this being mechanically the right way to do it. I mean, I'm not. It's not that I'm not comfortable with it. I know it is the wrong way to do it. Again, putting little... Actually, and as I'm saying that, I'm gonna... because I'm not gonna be able to tighten these nuts super tight. Sorry for the quick cut there. I went to my uh, supplies locker and got some Loctite because what I was thinking was uh, even with the way this is going together, I'm going to want to Loctite the Loctite these night nuts because I'm not going to be able to put a full amount of mechanical force on them because they're just not. I don't want to pull the solder up. So instead of having to worry about that, I'll just snug them down and then lock tight them. Ah. See, it's, as I was tightening that down, you probably heard the pop. It popped out of the solder. Again, this is a bad design. I'm not happy about this design. So I will just lay more solder down here. That's my. Nice. I thought I turned you off. That's an alarm. Shut up. So I just have to lay a lot more solder before I even try and tighten these nuts at all. Again, this is not, I'm not happy with this. I hope that'll hold. Again, I have a lot of test equipment, musical instruments, and so on, with ha which have plenty of screws coming through the front panels. This is 
bad design. Again, I like I like everything else about this, but because you can't, because you have have to use a tool to tighten these up, you don't get an exact sense of how much lifting force you're putting against those screws, and you don't know at what point they'll they'll break out of the solder. So you're guessing, and I don't like to guess on mechanical assembly. And that came out. Okay, I've got them as tight as I feel comfortable going without thinking I will strip them. So I'll drop some Loctite on them. And now we've got, oops, I didn't let the Loctite dry before I started moving on. So uh, let me do that. So now we're ready to use this. I did a couple of things off camera while I was stewing about how silly the way that panel goes together. I took the power and signal connector and added some additional lengths of wire to it. I didn't have any orange wire, so I used uh, black for that or green for that. But that's fine because on the other end, I, I'm only going to be using this uh, for Eurorack stuff, 3.5 millimeter. So I've got, I just soldered a jack onto the end of those wires so I can plug that in and I can always attach anything else to that if I want to measure something that's not Eurorack. The other thing I did was I drilled a hole in the front panel because I'm going to mount this jack coming through the front if I can do it without messing up too much or without being too much of a spud about getting it through these this hole. I know you can do it little jack. Maybe I'll actually use pliers to do this. There it goes. Now I'll put a panel nut on it. If I had thought about this sooner, of course, I would have drilled this hole and mounted the jack early in the process, but I didn't. But that's okay, because it wasn't that hard to do. Snug that down. And now we have everything we need. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and plug this connector in here right now. Now the only thing we need is 12 volts and a signal. You can use this on a variety of things. I'm just doing what I'm doing. The, the manual shows you how to set it up with a car stereo, with uh, a home stereo, with a speaker, whatever. I'm just going to be feeding it Eurorack signals, signals. So let me go ahead and get set up for seeing how this thing actually works. So we'll start simple. I've got my bench, one of my little benchtop power supplies that uh, I did a video on like a year or so ago. And I've connected the red lead. Now we'll connect the power lead and it lights up. And it says, well, man, I'm going to zoom in on this. Hopefully I can stay in the shot. And it's showing peak power. I flick it here. Mean dB meter. Hit the mode button again. Peak dB. Low, medium, high frequency. Third octave spectrum. RMS power peak power. So we've rolled back around. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start with this and what I'm going to feed into it first is I have this little handy portable signal generator and I'm going to put it as a sine wave, no attenuation, amplitude all the way down, frequency range I'll set at about, uh, I'll set at 100 
So let me plug this in. I don't have it turned on yet, so we won't see anything yet. I'll plug it into my little handy dandy front panel connector. Now I'll turn it on. And I'm not seeing anything because I don't have any. Ah, now we got the amplitude. See that black line? Again, it's very narrow because this is a very, so that's 20 times 100, so that's uh, 2,000 hertz. Now we'll watch it change. Now it's at 2.8, and this is showing 2K8. Perfect. Now we'll go to 32 or 3.2. Moved a little bit, little bit, little bit. Let me go up to 18 hertz. Yeah, it's getting very close to 200 hertz or 20,000 hertz. There's 20,000 hertz all the way at the end. So this is doing exactly what I would want. Let me go back to the middle range here. And again, because this is a pure sine wave that this is putting out, I don't expect a broad signal uh, frequency response. Uh, in fact, I would hope it doesn't because that shows me that this uh, generator is staying well within band. There's the power, peak power, 80 dB. Uh, the mean is plus 6, which is pretty high. Uh, and there's that again. So, that's pretty good. That That's an excellent start. That's showing me that with a single frequency, or roughly single frequency to the limit of the quality of this device, uh, it reads very accurately. Good, let me go get some other stuff. So now I've got one of my test racks here, and I've got a voltage-controlled oscillator here that we're feeding in, and you can see I've got this, uh, let me take it all the way down, frequency detuned all the way, and it's really low. Now as I take this up, you can see the frequencies riding up. Now it's all in the middle band. Now it's going to go higher. It's a little step function there that I don't think is really accurate, but that's okay. So that's what it's doing. And again, because this is an oscillator with some harmonics in it, uh, it's not the straight line we saw with the sine wave. Now I'm going to try one other. I've got a uh, white noise generator here that I will plug into. And now you can see, because it's white noise, it's all the way across the frequency spectrum. I can change the rate. I don't know if that's going to make a difference. Nope, it's not making much of a difference. Uh, let me try slewing it differently. Now it's just giving us a nice indication of the spectrum of that. Now we do have pink noise on this noise generator, so let me plug into that. I didn't think ahead, so you can't hear what I'm showing, but that's okay. Now look at the pink noise. It's all the way across the frequency spectrum. Which is, and I'm turning down the rate, which lowers the dB level a little bit. Take the rate up, dB levels up. So look at that. That's a great... Now we'll go to blue noise, which is a relatively recent term, and you'll see it's only at that end. So this is working just fine as a good uh, audio analyzer for rough stuff. And there's the octave spectrum. Let me go back to the VCO for that so we can get a good frequency on that. Why, why am I missing mounting screws in my little rack out here? Am I doing that just to irritate myself? I guess so. So that's the octave spectrum. Let me take it down. You'll see how it slides down as I take the tuning of the oscillator down. And now we'll slide all the way up. And it goes all the way up to pretty much the end of audible. All I'll go back to the center. I'm switching now to the power. Don't care about that. Peak power. Don't care about that. And the other power things. So again, as you can see, it does exactly what you would expect it to do, which is pretty cool. It's 
not necessarily something you can record from, obviously, and you might want something that's more accurate or has a wider uh, display so you can see what's going on better. But I'm going to mount this in my uh, main studio Eurorack module and just have it handy if I want to look for uh, characteristics or if I want to match two oscillators or something like that. So except for this, ma this goofy soldering the screw heads to the front panel, which as you can see, if I'm comfortable drilling holes in it to put a jack in it, it shouldn't be a big deal to drill some actual holes here and put the screws in there. Besides that, it's a good kit, went together well, and as you can see, works pretty dang well. Hope you enjoyed the video.